From our stakeholder advisory group, I'm Amy uh, Soder. I've been the chair now for my, my second meeting, so I'm well seasoned. Um, but so the first thing on the agenda, Lindsay takes care of everything, so we're, uh, that makes it happier for me. Uh, the first thing on our agenda is to uh, review the minutes from the June meeting. Uh, we did um, that, and Lindsay sent out those minutes previously. And so if you've had a chance to look at them and are on the committee, would like to, uh, or have any questions or corrections, we'd be happy to hear that. Uh, otherwise, I'd be happy to accept a motion to approve the minutes. Jennifer Carey, move to approve. And a second? Second. And a second. Tell me your name again. Eileen. Eileen. I knew that, but I'm terrible, especially that's out here. Um, all right. Uh, any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Any opposed? Fantastic. So that was easy. All right. The best part of these meetings, I believe, are the presentations. I think it's really fascinating, and I learned lots of things that I either wanted to know more about or didn't know I wanted to know more about, but actually did. Um, and so first, we're going to welcome up Demetria Kimball uh, Melhorn from the Division of Environmental Services. And we'll throw it up with everybody that's here. Um, talking about Green Space Trust, partnering with the community to improve underutilized green space. How are you all doing this morning? Good. good. I had a few answers. That's good. So um, as Amy had said, my name is Demetria Kimball Melhorn. I work with Environmental Services uh, under the Department of Water Quality. I'm here today to talk about our Green Space Trust uh, and how they are working with the community to improve underutilized green spaces. Not going to lie, I'm going to kind of see if I can get through this presentation. I recently lost our administrative staff, Kristen, to a new job. so. She's put some of this presentation together, which is really great, so I didn't have to try and fumble through and find things, but uh, please forgive me if I miss something. So, a little bit about the Green Space Commission and Trust. So the commission actually started back in 1990 as a citizen-based uh, advisory group to look at all of the county's unique uh, environmental aspects. Uh, this actually was a precursor to our PDR program and so they've done a lot of really great things throughout the years. In 2002, the trust was actually created as a 501c3 uh, nonprofit. That was really created to be able to take the conservation easement for the Coldstream SEP project. And so, in addition, because it's a nonprofit, they can actually get grant funding um, and we can have donations and hold other additional conservation easements. As administrative staff, we had two different ordinances. We had the commission and the trust. So they were actually the same group of people. What happened is we would have to go through and do a meeting for the commission, close that meeting, open meeting for the trust. That's a paperwork nightmare. So to this year, actually, we were able to combine the commission and trust under one ordinance. So now we're shortened down to Green Space Trust. If I use commission, if I use trust, they're interchangeable. So in 2018, Environmental Services staff took over the Green Space Commission and Trust from Division of Planning. At that point, the commission had kind of been more of a just general citizens board, didn't really have a lot of actions, didn't know, you know, had a lot of speakers come in, but no, they weren't really engaged in any particular way. So as staff, I'm also the Greenway coordinator. Uh, we all hold very many different hats. <coughs> I was really trying to find a way to engage that particular group and see what they could do. So green space, greenway coordinator, what can they do? Well, really we were, we had established a goal to look at all of the different greenways and green spaces and create management plans. The city owns over 290 parcels under two acres. That's just what environmental services actually maintains, not what is in parks and facilities, pump stations, etc. So that's a total of 105 acres. Some of these are small lots, individual spaces. Some are small lots combined that were bought out from water quality flood lots. Kilrush, Furlong, Doville, you may some have heard of some of those areas. But then we also have very small remnant parcels 
all spread all over uh, throughout the county. They could be detention basins, uh, environmentally sensitive areas, a whole variety of things. So really what I did was I pushed for the commission trust, the trustees, to see what they could do. Could they go down from a high level to a boots on the ground? What does that look like? So we kind of created a model on taking those particular, like, how do we go through this? We want to take an area, we want to develop it, but we kind of have to have steps on how to go through that process. This is a whole long model, but basically we chose, they chose an area, they had a site, as, um, site assessment, did some brainstorming design concepts, then had a public meeting. We could have all the information we want, create a concept, but if the public doesn't like it, well then it doesn't really matter um, because then we're just gonna get resistance. So we really wanted their input. We took that design, whatever it happens to be, I'm gonna show you examples in a few minutes, refined that design, heard what they said as the public, came back, presented that design idea again. From there, we had to, we put it in phases. What could we implement? How much did it cost? Where were we gonna get our funding sources? And of course, if we were able to implement it, how are we going to maintain it? So that's also a very big thing, is we don't want to implement something without being able to maintain it. So the advantage is Environmental Services already has this really great maintenance program for our green spaces and we were, able to, we were able to absorb a lot of this area under that maintenance program. But we still have to have a cost. What does it look like? So the idea is really to take some of these underutilized areas and create a vibrant gathering place, water quality aspect, just different things that I'm gonna kinda of go through what we've done so far. Our first one that we did, Dantzler Court. So Dantzler Court uh, is a water quality buyout lot that was bought out in 2007-2008 uh, and just basically bulldozed and created this open green area, kind of overrun by invasive species, just an open lot, nobody knew really what to do with it. So through our process, the commissioners went out, looked at it, did a site assessment, came up with a design. So this was the pie in the sky design they came up with, uh, not only from talking to neighbors, uh, but creating, you know, keeping an open space so the kids could come play, something inviting, uh, adding additional trees, maybe some signage. Um, and then we had some budget, like, all right, great. We have a design. Now what do we do? We had some really great buy-in from the uh, council members. We had some trustees that went after grants. Uh, so they were proactive, went after grants, and then uh, internally, Environmental Services was also able to kick in some money. So for $16,000, which really isn't that much money when you're talking about a project, we were able to purchase a bench, remove invasive species. Our internal staff helped with that. With um, the Bluegrass Community Foundation, we purchased 10 trees, native trees when we were installed. COVID hit. So that was interesting, trying to put uh, all this together during COVID. Um, so we actually had an outdoor public meeting in September, spread out masks, talk to the neighbors. Okay, we have a trees installed. What else would you like to see? We put in what we call an adventure garden. Um, you guys will see pictures of it, but have you ever seen the logs uh, that are kind of placed around so kids can jump and you know use their imagination? Um, it's not a playground. We call it an adventure garden. That way it stays in the realm of a green space, not a park. We also added a stream buffer and a wildlife, a wildflower border, an educational sign, and parks uh, donated a bicycle rack for us that we had installed. So that was really great. So uh, council member Ellinger is a big bike cyclist. So he thought that was a really great spot to have as a destination, place to stop, relax, get a drink of water, and then move on. So this is what it looks like as an aerial view in February of 22. If you go look down at the corner, just remember it was a large open lot, green space, yard, not very inviting. So overhead, you can kind of see where we put the trees. The adventure garden back in the back is where we had our water quality buffer um, because there's a small stream that goes through there. 
And we also included a lot of flowering shrubs and plants, so it was an inviting space. This is what it looked like in June. I'd say that, that we had a fairly large success. We were able to uh, have a very inviting space, have a walking path, and the neighbors that we've talked to say it's actually being used quite a bit. So it was a huge success. Well, we had really <coughs> great momentum, and the trustees were like gung-ho, council members were gung-ho, what's our next one? What are we doing next? What are we doing next? Okay, so we've just implemented <laughs> Chancellor Court. What are we gonna work on? So as this was being finished up, let me move forward. We started on Eureka Springs. Um, so Eureka Springs is a detention basin that is over off of the Circle of Man of War that was built in the 80s. It's a typical detention basin, a hole in the ground. So we actually went through the same model. Uh, we did a site assessment um, as the trustees, and then we went back and had our public meeting to hear what people thought they might want, uh, create a design, and had another public meeting. This is where it's really important that we figured out to talk with the neighbors because um, up here, this is the detention basin, up here is a large open green space that really, as trustees, not knowing the neighborhood, we thought maybe we would put a picnic bench there or something to invite people to come in and relax. And really what we heard from the neighbors was a lot of people go to Mount Tabor Park. And then what they do is a lot of a lot of people cut through and cut through this neighborhood instead of going out to uh, Eureka Springs Drive. So what can we do? The neighbors actually said during COVID that detention basin wasn't cut very often. And they had a lot of reduced foot traffic going through because nobody wanted to walk through the tall grass. Okay, well let's run with that concept. So what we came up with was to actually create a wet meadow and create a passive recreation area that people can stop and enjoy the wildflowers. We made it a wildlife refuge pollinator garden. So we installed a bench, um, installed additional trees, a wet meadow. And one of the things, uh, another thing that we listened to the neighbors on is I was actually going to look at installing trees closer in this green area here to the uh, houses but some of the neighbors had um, gardens. And they're like, can you please not do that? Because we kind of want to grow our garden. So we did end up putting 21 trees in, but we pushed them out farther into the detention basin. This detention basin is what stays wet almost year round. Eureka Springs it has a natural spring in it. So to create a wet meadow was a fairly natural fit. So we actually had a budget of $25,000 that the council uh, members had approved through some extra funding. So part of the things that we learned is to create our design, create our budget, and then see what we can, you know, have different pieces that we can implement depending on what budget we have. And this is what it looks like in today, basically. Um, so we have created a really nice area that people can sit, enjoy. There's a bus stop across the way. A lot of people who are walking to the park have a chance to stop and relax and enjoy the different natural area. We also have an educational sign here so people understand what a wet meadow is, why water quality, aspects, and that kind of thing. The next one that we are working on, again, trustees are, have really great you know, enthusiasm and they want to move forward, is what we consider Cane Run Greenway. Edge Lawn, for those of you who know it as the detention basin. Um, so this area is near Castlewood. It's a fairly lower income area. Um, the neighbors really actually feel like we've ignored them and forgotten about them. So they were pretty, pretty happy that when we came out and did the first public meeting. And we're actually just breaking down to smaller bite-sized pieces. We know we can't, you know, take the whole thing on. So what can we do in small pieces and small phases? This, again, were water quality buyout lots that they created additional detention area in. So there's an upstream larger detention area, and this is a small stream that they daylighted, engineering daylighted, I believe around 2010. So one of those projects. This has a large transient consideration, um, so we have to think about things like that. 
Uh, so park benches might not necessarily be what we want to put here, uh, encouraging places to sleep, but we do want to encourage the local citizens to use it, residents to use it. So we're still in the design process and in phase, the initial phase. As you can see, our public meeting is coming up. Um, our first one was June 15th. Our public meeting is coming up next week. Just the initial thoughts. What do, you, based on what everybody thought, talked about, what do we want? Originally, we had talked about putting a play area here. That's really close to Brian Ave. They were really concerned with the kids being that close to Brian Ave. Okay, so if we just leave it open and create more of a park, what I consider a manicured park-ish setting, putting additional trees in, putting some flowering bushes, that kind of thing, making it more aesthetically, typically aesthetically pleasing so that they don't feel like we just ignored them and they ignored what they were thinking. This is our first shot. Again, we're gonna go back to the neighbors and see what they think. They may, they may want something else. Uh, it's a balancing act of what's, what we can afford, what we are kind of conceptually want to move forward with versus what they're looking at. The other area is Meadow Park. Um, this is an area that we actually are looking at doing some additional water quality meadow plantings down the middle. So we would have a low growing uh, meadow, similar to wet meadow, with some additional trees. Uh, that stays very wet. The mowers can't get in there very often. So having something that only is cut back once a year would help with water quality and aesthetics. <coughs> I am going to skip back to the slide I should have put at the end. Applying the model going forward of things that we have learned. I talked, don't rush the design and have set at least two public meetings. Listen to your neighbors. Um, create the designs and phases. One thing we learned uh, as we've gone along is what can we put in phases based on what budget we have. Uh, that way, you know, as you saw at Dancer Corp, we had four or five different funding sources. Um, and I think that's going to be more usual than having one large chunk of money, honestly, is be able to over the years. Um, and then keep it simple. We, we do have to maintain it. So what is the easiest maintenance going forward? The themes that we are going to continue, looking at our water quantity and water quality, that's always very important, but doesn't always have to be number one. Making the green space uh, accessible and equitable. You know, so um, again, is it Dantzler Court? Is it just an open lot? Nobody actually thinks that they can use, they don't know who owns it, that kind of thing, and making it inviting. Emphasize the five to 10 minute walk. I don't know if you guys know, Parks and the mayor has signed uh, a declaration that they are really concentrating on having a five to 10 minute bike or walk, uh, accessible green space or park. Um, so accessible is not necessarily a detention basin or an overgrown lot. It's something that is actually usable. And then improving all these under underutilized green spaces. Um, it's updating. <laughs> um, so what does that mean? Does that mean creating a community garden? Does that mean creating uh, a food forest? Does that just mean creating an area that people can stop and relax and just take a few minutes to take a breath in this busy, busy work life? So those are the things that really this, that we move forward, the trustees look at. As staff, we give them four or five different areas that we think is best suited, and they go out and make their, their decision on what they want to work on next. Oh, wrong way. So, any questions? If I can get my question slide, it's there. That's Dantzler Court. I have a quick question, Demetria. How do you um, connect with parks? Because a lot of your final product seems like more of a park than a, well, a green space and park are similar, but do you connect with parks at all, or is it just sort of an environmental services? It's more environmental services, but parks, we're always working together on several different things. So. Um, we have very careful to define parks considers a park a um, what is it a programmed space and so that's really the definitive difference although they have some open natural areas um, this is not programmed there's not open soccer fields there's not a play structure that kind of thing yes it's confusing 
we are. We all are confused too. <laughs> Major, just say a word about the difference between what Eureka Springs looked like a year ago oh. versus what it looks like today. It's worth driving by. It really is. So this is what it looks like today. It's difficult to tell in this, but it is full of color, yeah. full of color. And we were able to add, like I said, 21 trees part of them along the roadway and part of them within the basin so as we go through those will actually grow. It looked like a hole in the ground. It literally was uninviting, standing water, um, just eh. And I think that that's something that we've really tried to work on changing. Um, and it was only able to be mowed occasionally because it was, it was always wet. And so with the wet meadow, those and the trees, those root systems will absorb all of that water. So th we have this under a maintenance contract. So it's not going to be taken over by invasive species. Um, it's going to stay in perpetuity as long as, as long as we have that budget to be able to maintain it. And as far as I know, that will be Jennifer. <laughs> Jennifer keeps pushing to, to keep that budget. Ken? No, go ahead. Okay. Melissa. <laughs> um, that is just great and I can think of so many other applications throughout like the Kentucky River Basin where this would be useful for adding uh, green infrastructure for water controls but Lexington's always this model that I have to try to figure out how to adapt to smaller communities I'm not aware of anywhere any other cities that do like have a trust arrangement like this do you think it's adaptable for smaller communities to do this type of thing? Absolutely. Yeah. If there's any kind of nonprofit that can uh, within those smaller communities, I mean, we have lots of friends of that yeah. we work with closely that could be the entity to assist um, in that. I mean, we kind of have that model now where, when I'll use Ken, I mean, he goes and has, has his budget and his grants, but he works closely with the city on what areas should be could be implementable, what could we do, what could we move forward with. Um, and really, honestly, creating a 501-3C is $15, $25? No, it's more like, it, but it's more she more. knows how to do that. Yeah. But the question is, will they have the local ordinances? And I would say that any community that uses the FEMA buyout money to buy properties is an excellent candidate for this model. Uh, so Danville, Richmond, all the other places that have those FEMA programs. And I just learned that there's a whole bunch of land along the Kentucky River that has been purchased under this that usually belongs to county governments. Um, so I, I think that would be an excellent uh, a way to transpose that model onto other communities. And, and really we are looking at small budgets, right? I mean, $16,000 again was um, for Dantzler was pulled from several different sources. Um, Twenty-five. We were able to get that twenty-five thousand for Eureka Springs. Uh, we have ten to fifteen thousand for Cane Run. Um, so we're not talking of a significant amount that you couldn't get grants for. It sounds like the trust is sort of driving the selection of these projects uh, more than the community driving that. Uh, is there a way, for example? neighborhood has a green space, but we don't know how the city views that, what it's used for, what its, uh, what its potential is. Do you have existing studies and documents that could be made available that sort of classify the green spaces, uh, or could we meet with individuals to talk about it? Um, so ironically, we're actually working towards that to, to do some sort of master study, but as I said, just under two acres, we have 290 parcels, uh, 105 acres. So if you have a particular area, feel free to reach out to me afterwards and we can bring it up to the trust. I mean, really, so we take everything as staff, and we give the trustees you know, uh, some options, and then they go out and say, okay, well, I think this is best suited. Um, these, these three are all over, right? We have no one particular area they're concentrating on. And I think, again, as I said, they're smaller, obtainable um, to implement something to implement stuff, something. 
Are you ready, Ken? <laughs> uh, I think this is an excellent model, and I appreciate the Green Space Trust Commission doing this. But it looks like it takes you about two years from the time you nominate a property until you get stuff on the ground. So with your 200 and some odd properties, that means we'll complete this program in 400 years. <laughs> so is there a way to um, replicate the process with other parties, um, you know, like neighborhood associations, homeowners associations, that kind of stuff, where they can do, they can propagate the model um, in, in a certain way to do it in their local areas? Does, is the commission trust willing to uh, essentially authorize or sponsor or um, somehow um, sanction that kind of activity. I'm sure that's definitely something that we can take back to them, but I think that is why we're trying to do this model, is we have these steps that mm -hmm. have been mm -hmm. refined. Like, this is not necessarily how it started. We have learned a lot over the last couple of projects. And you get that real-world so. experience where you can then govern and guide the other, other entities. And the second question I've got relates to what I would call abandoned properties. Uh, I think you know several examples uh, where the property ownership is not known. Um, and in terms of does the Commission Trust have a way to identify these properties and then process getting them either under government control or under some sort of Not at this time. Really, like you had said, we have 290 parcels, so really their concentration at this time is electricity to own what we, what we have and what we own. Uh, Jimmy said, can I add something to that? We deal with that a lot, and, and they, the ownership is known. It's it's a ghost corporation or ghost individuals that don't that even aren't alive anymore. I've, I've got one right now that the three owners are deceased. They named some guy as the as the president, but in terms of the, the Secretary of State's office, they're non-existent. They're defunct. And so when I when I presented this to the law department, they they described this as a uh, a bar exam question because <laughs> there's no real answer to it. It's really hard. But we're running across them all the time, and, and not just where the corporation is defunct, but where there is no owner assigned. In other words, when you click on the parcel map, it says uh, no information available. And you ask PVA, and they say, eh, you know, maybe the original land grant still owns it, you know, something like that. So, so I know that's something planning uh, and environmental services and water quality still struggle with. We don't really have a good answer for that right now, but we're, we're working through it. It happens. It, we had another one that came up the other day. It was supposed to have been a road and didn't end up being a road, so who actually owns it and what's going to happen to it? So. How are the, uh, how is the ownership identified? Is it just owned by LVCG? These are, these are platted ownership, parcel ownership by the city of Lexington. Okay, so there's no way for us to know that it's actually water quality versus another LVCG entity. Not as a citizen, not easily, but the good thing is we work together really a lot with all of the interdepartments, parks, water quality, environmental services, and so we help we can help identify who, who maintains it. Yes. On these properties, no owner, why can't the city step in and just take that property? That's a law question. <laughs> they can. That's the actual answer with the political will. It is condemnation. Yeah. They go in and take it. They can. And they can. Sure they can. I mean, that'll get, you talk about if you want to find out somebody that don't, that'll get them out of their work. I mean, to say that we're slowing down or we can't do this, we can do this. It's about my case code. But what does it cost per parcel? It costs like twenty thousand dollars for each parcel to do the uh, declarative judgment and do the surveys and do the, you know, all that kind of stuff. And then you've got to find somebody at two hundred East Main Street willing to do that paperwork and the maintenance of it. I mean, because once we once we yeah, take ownership possible. of it, we do try and keep the maintained and the budget for that. It just sounds like an excuse not to do it. I mean. I don't think we should stand up and say, I'm going to get into this at the end of this program. Sorry. Why can't we do something um, rather than here's how we have to go about doing it? And I think that's a very good question. Uh, I don't think I'm the correct person. No, you're not. I'm just <laughs> getting it out here as something that the group might want to look at, you know, longer term. Because I think there's a lot of these properties that are out there 
and uh, you know, if, if nobody's owning them, they're probably not paying taxes either. So, you know, we, we should put these pieces into, you know, higher and better use. That's somebody's responsibility. It's not this group's. Here's part of the problem. The word condemnation is a negative connotation. And politicians don't like to use it if they don't have to. And in fact, I can tell you about a public road project that took years and years and years and years just because the government wouldn't condemn little tiny pieces of property for the right way. Just wouldn't do it. Okay? So it, it's it's a, a perception and a political problem to utilize condemnation. There's a way to fix that too. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just think it's where you've got good projects and ownership is standing in your way, I mean, that should be a big priority. And I think you, I'm not saying it. and I it's do. our responsibility, but it's somebody to say, get it on somebody's radar to say, this is important. We need this piece of property. And here's the situation on ownership and can move. I do understand that, um, absolutely, but I also, you have to remember we have 290 parcels already right. that we're trying to absolutely. see what we can do with. So we already have a large chunk to, to bite off. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much. Thank you. That's the most heated I've seen this group get, so. Um, I'd like to uh, welcome up Kenton Senna and Peyton Mills from the Lewis Honors College at UK. Uh, they're gonna talk about urban riparian reforestation for stormwater quality improvement. Uh, Kenton, Kenton and I go way back. We went up the elevator together. Welcome. Thank you. Well, uh, thanks. Uh, I'm really thankful to be here, and thanks, Lindsay, for the invitation. And thanks, Amy, for the introduction. So, like Amy said, my name is Kenton Sun. I teach in the Honors College in UK. Um, I know some folks in this room. Sorry, Ken, I'll speak up. Um, I, uh, uh, so I teach in the Honors College at UK. My background is in reforestation of surface mines in eastern Kentucky. Um, and since being in the Honors College, um, I've been delighted to work with Heather uh, and Nathan to do work with reforested bluegrass sites uh, around town. So we're really, we're really thankful for that. Um, and I'm joined by Peyton. Peyton, do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, yeah, I'm a senior environmental and sustainability studies major at UK. Um, I'm in the Honors College as well. Uh, I grew up in a mining town, so all this water quality issues are super important to me. Um, and I'm really honored that uh, I'm on this project, thanks to Dr. Kinson. Well, uh, thankful for being here. So, all right, so we'll uh, move right in. Um, I'm gonna kind of blitz through these early slides because you all already know this already, but we know that streams and urban areas uh, can suffer from a lot of stresses and have some impairments. Um, these can include uh, shifts in hydrology, um, where the increase in impervious surface area in the city uh, shifts, uh, causes shifts in uh, storm, uh, well, it creates extra storm flow, which shifts hydrology, which can alter stream channels and so on. And we also have a lot of water quality issues in, in urban areas, um, stuff that runs off lawns and stuff that runs off parking lots and so on. Um, all of it ends up in streams at some point. So, um, and this isn't an issue that's going away. Globally, the population of the human population is becoming more urbanized over time. Um, so we're uh, going to have to be more and more creative about solving some of the environmental challenges of urban dwellings. Um, our kind of key question here, our, our entry point is um, reforestation as a potential like, solution to some of these challenges from a streamwater perspective. Um, uh, reforestation and or other kinds of, of stream restoration. So um, as I mentioned, I've worked with Heather on reforested bluegrass sites. Uh, several reforested bluegrass sites have streams that run through them. Um, so my kind of initial entry point into this was, well, let's just monitor the water quality at these reforested bluegrass sites that have streams and see if that reforestation activity has had any kind of effect on the water quality. And our preliminary sampling from that, uh, sampling that we started in 2020, suggested that we, act, we had nitrate uh, reduction 
um, just as the stream was passing through Reforested Reach um, in several of those Reforested Reach sites. So that was kind of a really interesting preliminary finding. We thought we would um, go back to see if we can get some more. So we went to KWRI, got some additional funding to continue that, uh, that project and expand its scope a little bit. Um, so let's not get ahead of myself here. Um, we're, you know, again, kind of uh, drawing on uh, the report, leaning on the Reforce of Bluegrass program, um, added a, a section of Wolf Run, um, and we also added a couple sites uh, along Alumni Drive that are not um, Reforce of Bluegrass sites, but they are stream restoration projects. Um, okay. So these are the, we, we ended up with seven sites. Uh, several of these are Reforce of Bluegrass sites, Masterson Station, Ribbon, a section of West Hickman, a tri and a tribu another tributary to Hickman Creek and Veterans Park. Those are all Reforce of Bluegrass sites. These two alumni drive sites, as I just mentioned, are, are stream restoration uh, projects that were done um, several years ago. And then Wolf Run, um, we just worked with a, a stretch of Wolf Run that Ken recommended. Um, that, they have been working with for, for a, a long time, um, doing various sorts of conservation activities. Um, so the reforested bluegrass sites, all that was done on those sites was trees were planted in the riparian area. There wasn't any additional like channel reconstruction, any of, any of that kind of stuff. The alumni drive sites were natural channel design projects where they went in and you know dug up and did like extensive stream restoration work. Um, and the uh, Wolf Run site has had many things um, along it, uh, and, and Ken would be able to tell, tell you much more detail about um, what's going on here. Um, just to kind of give you an idea of what we're looking at here, um, the, this is the, one of the Alumni Drive sites. Uh, this is Alumni Drive along the top of the slide here, University Drive over here in this corner, and Nicholasville Road over here, um, just to point you to the, the figure. Um, so we collected a sample at the upstream section of this reach and the downstream end of this reach um, every other week for since November. So we almost have a full year of water quality sample sampling um, from these, these sites at this point. Peyton is continuing that uh, this semester. Uh, so our very, our very basic sampling design is upstream, downstream sampling, um, take them to the lab, do, uh, do the analyses, and then uh, so if we're experiencing any, any kind of significant and consistent differences from upstream to downstream. Um, and this is just the Masterson Station site as an example of the upstream sampling point and downstream. So um, kind of our, our key questions here are um, whether the, the restoration activity is associated with any kind of shifts in stream water quality. Um, we're also curious about whether uh, there are any uh, effects to, uh, measurable effects to macrovertebrate communities. So we're doing macrovertebrate sampling and, and assessing those. And then we're also, um, this summer we implemented some riparian um, buffer soil analysis as well. So looking at whether the, the, reforest, the buffer area along the stream that was, for example, planted with trees as far as part of the forest of bluegrass, um, whether that, that restoration activity has any kind of measurable effect on soil properties. Those are our kind of basic questions. Water quality, as I've mentioned, we've got these every other week um, samples collected in pairs upstream and downstream across all seven sites, um, measured for lots of different things. The one thing that I want to talk about today is nitrate, because I think that's particularly of interest. Um, and we talk about it a lot when we're thinking about uh, water quality improvement. This table is really busy. I apologize for that. Um, we've got the sites across the top. And then for each site, we've got a mean difference. This is the mean difference across all of our um, sampling pairs between the upstream and downstream sampling. Um, and then a p-value. That p-value is a uh, significance uh, of, the, of a pairwise um, uh, t-test, a paired, a paired t-test um, between those upstream and downstream samples um, paired by date. Um, so I wanted to just highlight that nitrate was was a, a, a constituent that actually decreased significantly in in several of our sites. I think that was pretty interesting. Um, so these are these are in uh, milligrams per liter for for nitrate. So we had a, a point almost a 0.2 milligram per liter um, mean 
decrease in nitrate concentrations from upstream to downstream in the Alumni East site, uh, over half a milligram per liter uh, decrease in the Alumni West site. Um, the tributary to Hickman, we had um, 0.259 uh, milligram per liter decrease. Uh, the Masterson Station site had a slight increase that was not significant, statistically significant, and I'll talk more about that in just a second. Um, Riven Park was also not significant, and West Hickman was also not significant. But Wolf Run, Ken, you'll be excited to know, we also had a, a 0.17 milligram per liter um, significant decrease on average from upstream to downstream sampling. Um, so we're, we're seeing in the nitrate, we're seeing a decrease in nitrate concentration. Um, as you move through that, uh, that restoration or restored or reforested reach. Um, and I think that's really interesting. And I think from a, a scaled up kind of basin perspective, and Melissa, I'm thinking, thinking about what you were saying about, you know, how can we, how can we um, take the really cool work that Dimitri was talking about and, and disseminate it and, and make this happen in other places. Um, I suspect that we could do relatively small scale uh, restoration work like tree planting in riparian areas um, and that that would scale up the water quality impacts at, at the basin level uh, in, a, in a pretty remarkable way. So I'm, I'm excited about that possibility. Um, this is just a quick example of, of what those upstream versus downstream concentrations look like over, over a, a sampling period. So for alumni uh, west and alumni east, you'll see the upstream is the orange line and the downstream is the um, blue line, and you see that fairly consistent separation where the upstream is, is pretty consistently higher than the downstream. Even though they're both varying over the course of the, of the sampling period, we are having a, a significant and consistent decrease in, in that concentration. All right, hey. uh, Yeah, so that brings us to macroinvertebrates. Um, we divided each uh, sod into three sub-sods. So of course we had the up and downstream as we were doing with the water quality, but we also added a midstream sod uh, to that for the macroinvertebrates. So that's three leaf packs per sub-sod per stream. Um, and we left these in the stream for several weeks uh, at a time. Then we would go back, collect them, bring them to the lab, uh, process them. So that was just cleaning the leaves off, um, washing all the macroinvertebrates into a bucket, and then preserving those. Um, and then we would go back and identify those by taxa. And that was the closest taxa to species as we could get, which was generally order, uh, sometimes suborder for things like dragonflies and damselflies. Um, then we conducted data analyses on that, so we uh, got a diversity uh, score, so using the Shannon Diversity Index, uh, we had richness, evenness, and then we also calculated a pollution tolerance index score uh, for each um, leaf pack itself. Um, and that's using the Stroud Water Research Center um, method, which basically weights uh, taxa by sensitive, somewhat sensitive, or tolerant to pollution levels. And then you add those together to get your final uh, score. Um, of course, there were some minor issues with this. Um, in the summertime, certain streams will dry up completely, so that left a few bags dry. Um, or flashy flooding would push it up onto the banks where, of course, it would dry out. But uh, that definitely didn't impact every side, and it very rarely impacted more than a couple at each side. Um, some of the significant findings, uh, diversity was overall pretty low. Um, of course, that super low side of the diversity, that 0 0.0323, was from a dry bag. So it's a little skewed in that way. Um, but your average diversity just, you know, for any expected ecosystem is about 1.5. So we're a little below that. Um, however, with that being an average, there are sections of the world that have a more normal lower diversity levels anyway. Kentucky is one of those. Um, so that's not a completely negative number. Um, our richness is 1 to 9. Our evenness is um, on the higher side, but of course that super high 0.961 um, is almost always correlated with a super low diversity which is expected. Um, our pollution tolerance uh, fared um, from port of fair, um, 1 to 13, so we didn't break into those upper echelons of sensitivity. Um, but of course, over time, some of these sites are still very young. That could definitely change. Um, however, we did notice that site variability diluted a lot of the findings. Um, so you can see in this very small table, um, we have the p-values for site and location, and we can see that site just really diluted everything. 
Uh, so we did it. In, I did it in Innova, trying to see if there were consistent patterns across all the sites, and, and essentially the variability with, across sites was was like washing out any any consistent patterns within sites. So we um, we ended up just doing within site analysis. Um, here's the abundance of macroinvertebrates by slot. So across the bottom, the blue is upper, and then as you move along the string, we have middle and then down. Um, and we can see fairly consistently, of course, some of them are skewed. This one in particular was all dry. Um, but for the sites that stayed completely wet, so Ribbon Park and then the two alumni sites on the far right, um, they all show this pretty consistent pattern of as you increase down the stream, you increase in abundance for macroinvertebrates, which is very encouraging. Um, these are tolerance distributions, and we're looking particularly at somewhat sensitive versus tolerant species. Um, there were some sensitive taxa found, um, however, um, they weren't at every site, so it's not a super good comparison to make, and when they were present, they were in super low numbers. Um, so instead of that, we're using somewhat sensitive versus tolerant taxa, um, and we can see pretty consistently the blue um, is your somewhat sensitive, and then your orange is your tolerant, and somewhat sensitive uh, taxa always dominate, um, except, of course, in some of your dry bags, um, which are, of course, you. Um, these are just some minor correlations. These are not super strong correlations. Of course, over more sampling periods, longer times, um, and more frequent sampling, you might exemplify these better. Um, but essentially, we're seeing correlations between the age of the site, so how long has the restoration been there, um, versus average diversity and average pollution tolerance index score. These are positively correlated, so as those increase, um, so does the diversity and the um, pollution tolerance of the taxa found. Um, we see the opposite with nitrate as expected. The more nitrate you have in a stream, the less diversity you're going to have in your taxa. So, you know, Peyton mentioned doing more uh, sampling. We would really like to, this was like a, we did one kind of, one go of the macroinvertebrate sampling. So we would like to repeat that analysis um, a little bit more robustly, maybe next spring, and see if we, see if we have consistent, or continued, um, continued, uh, consistency in those results. Um, the other, oh, okay. okay. Uh, the other thing, of course, that we added was soils. Um, and so we're really looking at, does the um, riparian zone, does that new buffer zone, uh, impact the soil health and communities of my, uh, microbial communities within that soil at all versus with the grass zones um, nearby? Um, so at each of these three subsites, upper, middle, and down, um, within about two meters within the uh, buffer zone, we would take a soil sample and then we would step about two meters outside of it and take another. Um, and of course we looked at that for all your typical things, phosphorus, nitrates, uh, calcium, um, and we did an infiltration analysis afterwards um, at each of those same sites that we took the soil samples. Uh, so basically you stick a double ring infiltrometer in the ground, fill it with water, and over five minute intervals you see how much water has infiltrated into the soil. Um, we're also doing DNA extraction right now on those soil samples. Um, we've extracted that DNA, diluted it when necessary. Um, this is actually just some of the equipment we use. Um, the computer will read your concentrations of DNA so you know if you need to dilute it uh, before you run PCR. So polymerase chain reaction, we're just amplifying that DNA before we sequence it to see what taxa are present. And that one specifically is a soil microbial community analysis. So we're um, working with our, uh, with Mo Lab um, at UK um, Plantsville Sciences to see if we can assess any, if, to test for any differences in microbial communities um, between these uh, mowed grass sites and adjacent um, reforested sites. Um, so our significant findings uh, with those soil samples, uh, interestingly, was with zinc, which is important for plant health. It uh, helps promote chlorophyll, um, which of course promotes plant growth in general. Um, and we see, uh, this is at the Hickman tributary site, uh, we see a net increase, almost doubling, of zinc between the grass to the buffer zone. Um, and that's definitely something to watch um, and see if it continues to increase because increased zinc at a certain concentration can begin to uh, inhibit plant growth. Um, so although it is important, it can be a negative thing and it's something the future samples should look at. But also with soils, like with um, with the microinvertebrates and with the water quality, the 
variability across sites was pretty significant. So our kind of we didn't really find a lot of uh, significant differences between buffer and adjacent grass soils for the things that we were measuring, which I was actually surprised surprised by. Um, so quick, uh, maybe takeaway points. Um, we are seeing some shifts in water quality uh, as uh, streams are moving through these restored areas. I think that that's positive. I think there's uh, that's a great thread to keep pulling on. Um, one kind of thing, I guess, X factor that remains to be determined is whether that's a concentration or dilution effect. Um, so if we're having you know, additional water that's being added to the stream through that reach, uh, and we may be seeing a dilution effect, and that's why our concentration is going down. Um, or conversely, if we have water that's being taken out of the stream, that might be part of uh, why we're seeing concentration at a couple of the, of the sites where the nitrate concentration is increasing through that reach. So um, a next step, uh, hopefully, if we can get the funding, is to deploy some water um, stream flow sensors at uh, our sites to see if we're experiencing any shifts in stream flow through that reach as well. And then use that uh, stream flow data to, to paired with the concentration data uh, to compute loads um, and give us a better idea of, of actual nitrate uptake or addition through the reach. Um, and then um, more macroinvertebrate community sampling. Again, um, I, was, I just had some students in my office yesterday who were interested in doing some research and hopefully we'll be able to, to get them out in the field to do more macroinvertebrate stuff in the spring. Um, and um, like Peyton said, he's working on the, the microbial analysis right now and hopefully we'll have um, those samples off to sequencing in the next couple weeks and have some, have some idea fairly soon about soil microbial diversity between the uh, grass sites and adjacent buffer sites. Um, any, hopefully we have time for questions. I don't know. We talked for a long time. So mm -hmm. Questions? Um, so you had mentioned that you had some macros that were gluten tolerant and you know in high abundance. Have you guys gone back and looked at what your drainage area is for these the different sites? Um, thinking that you may have more significant gluten runoff potential upstream on some areas versus others, just to kind of to look at, especially if you do additional macro movements correlation. That's a great question. Um, we have not. We did add like re reach length and kind of restored area buffer area in our most recent uh, kind of data data pool. But I think adding drainage area is a great idea. So for sure. We'll make a note of that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah Ken. Can you go back to your uh, table of results that included the infiltration data, please? Yeah, if I can. Well, I think it was two slides back. One slide back. Thanks. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, there, that one. Yeah. Um, that is for one site. That's uh, this your is for one infiltration. Site. Could you yeah. uh, explain to me what those numbers mean? Yeah. So this is the mean buffer, um, the mean, mean infiltration uh, rate in the buffer. Remind me the units. That is milliliters of water per. And that's per, per, per five time. minute interval. Per All right. Time. And then yeah. and then what's the value? Twenty two. So this is the it's the mean difference between the buffer and the grass. And, and then what this units? is. Sorry. Same, same, the app, same units, the yeah. Value. Okay. Yes. So, and then, uh, so, um, do you think you can translate that to uh, gallons per hour or anything along that line, or cubic feet? Per sure. Day? Yeah, I don't see why not. Yeah. But you are showing a, a, a difference. So okay. it's not statistically significant. That p value is pretty high. Um, yeah. Yeah, which I was kind of surprised by. I figured we would see see a more more um, like increased infiltration in the in the buffer sites. So. I think, I mean, we had a low sample size for this. We did three pairs of soil samples per per site. Um, so I think maybe doing a more robust soils analysis. And, you know, Ken, with the, the grant that um, you were writing that we were we were on, we might we might try to up, up the scale or the robustness of this particular analysis and see um, what kinds of, see how that affects things. And then I noticed you didn't have total phosphorus or SRP or anything like that yeah. in your analysis. Is there a reason? Um, uh, for water quality, or? yeah, yeah, um, we our samples are analyzed by Millie at the Department of Forestry for free, 
and she doesn't do she <laughs> phosphorus is not something that she does. So yeah. Yeah. That's, seems like a good reason. Let's say you I saw you hand oh, up. Just a quick question. So especially with the macroinvertebrates, I was curious about if there were other um, PMPs used besides just tree plantings like that mm -hmm. might help uh, enhance the macro invertebrate community that like reduce scouring, like slow moderation, like especially probably in Wolf Run, there's something yeah. done besides just right. tree plantings. Well your alumni drive site, they did a total right. Uh, basically, they, yes. they redid the stream bed, yeah. so they would improve the habitat. But I noticed you were doing leaf packs, which tends to favor your shredders as opposed to uh, your more predatory um, uh, beds and macroinvertebrates. So I don't know if that, I mean, I'm, I use leaf packs in, in larger bodies of water and in lakes um, and flowing streams. We use the traveling kick method or yeah. we use uh, uh, riffle sand. Yeah, I think we'll do, we'll add some additional sampling methods in the spring pending that we can actually do that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so the reforested bluegrass sites, Heather, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the only stuff that was done there was okay. tree planting. Okay, so no other. There was no like stream channel, right? Yeah. Except for cold stream, which is not one of Not one of ours, yeah, that we, that we sampled here. Yeah, great question. Yeah, you had a question. When you did the infiltration studies, did you do any kind of census of uh, plant types in where you took the soil samples in the buffer to differentiate different effects of trees versus shrubs and forbs and things like that? Yeah, that's a good that's a good question. So for all of the reforest, the bluegrass sites, it was a, a, a well tree buffer area. The alumni drive sites are much more recent, and the trees there are not well grown. Um, so those would have been like a tall grass kind of shrub um, plant community. Um, the adjacent grass site was mowed for all of all of the sites. It was just like mowed lawn. Um, so I think it's fairly typical um, of, of a mowed lawn. Uh, it would be really interesting to those of us who do these restoration projects. Yeah. You know, we have a wide variety of plants to choose from. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and there's general guidances about that. Yeah, it'd be really nice to know the certain plants. You know, the deeper in plants have a greater effect on the shell. So yeah, yeah. I think that would be a great, a great follow-up question. You know, and again, we just did like three pairs of so of the infiltration analysis and soil analysis on the sites, but a more like stratified sampling approach where we we're like maybe doing infiltration right next to a tree and a little bit further away from a tree or so on. I think that could be a, a great idea. Yeah, Jason. Yeah. So, have you looked at non-restored sites? like a comparison so you can well measure the benefit right. our thought with that was the upstream downstream comparison right but, but comparing a similar length of stream okay. hasn't been restored that's a good like idea. might have another station even further upstream right that's a good idea yeah we haven't done that we'll make it a this one <laughs> um we do have data um you know that from other work that the city has done, uh, and so I'm working with Lindsay and others to try to think about how we can leverage those data up, up for context. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Other questions? Thank you all. Thank you very much, Kenton. <coughs> So I'm thrilled because Bluegrass Green Source has been around for 21 years, and for each of our 21 years, we've worked closely with Reforest the Bluegrass, and so I'm excited to have data that supports, at least is moving towards supporting the usefulness of Reforest the Bluegrass, too. Um, so next, Heather Wilson uh, is coming up. Uh, she's going to talk about using trees and stormwater basins to increase urban tree camping. Heather? Hello, you all. I'm Heather Wilson. I am with the Division of Environmental Services, and I'm in urban forestry. I know a lot of your faces, but there's also a lot of your faces I have I've never met. So um, feel free to stop me through this. If you have questions, you don't have to wait till the end. If it you know if it dawns on you, I'm going through. I am a tree nerd. I'm not well versed in water. So um, so hope I mean they're tied together. We all know that. Um, but so so please uh, just let me kind of rant on trees for a little bit, and then we can certainly go from there. Um, <laughs> But just to cover real quick what we'll walk through today while we're talking about our urban forest, um, we're talking about, I'm going to talk about the importance of trees. I'm sure most of you know this. I'm sure most of you have talked about this in one aspect or another at some point. 
Um, and I'm also going to talk a little bit about their vital role in helping to increase our urban tree canopy and how we can ideally use our stormwater basins to help with that. I do also tend to talk really fast, so if anyone needs me to slow down, just raise your hand. <laughs> um, I'll cover the tree basics, like I said, the benefits of trees. Um, ideally, most of you have probably talked about the benefits of trees in some aspect or another, but I'm hoping to be able to maybe bring up some things that you hadn't thought about before. Um, a little bit of biology. You didn't know you were going to have a biology lesson today, but we'll go real quick because um, I think it's really important because you have to understand that to understand how trees move through or water moves through trees. And that's really important for understanding trees in the water cycle. I'll talk about our urban tree canopy. Um, our canopy assessment that we did back in 2012 really quick and then just a really quick um, update on our updated uh, canopy assessment um, and a little bit of our basins and how we can use those trees in there. But first, you have a pop quiz. So just like I said, I'm sure you all have talked a lot about tree benefits and what those are for the community, but I want to know what you all, like what comes to mind when you think about the benefits that trees give us. And we can raise hands or I'll call on the people that I know. <laughs> Cooling. Cooling, right, okay, yep. Yeah. Demetria. Uh, for transpiration. Okay, Ken. Uh, air filter. Doug? Uh, shades my garden too much. <laughs> well, that's not a benefit for your garden. <laughs> no, it is for your soil. Um, Charlie? You only want benefits because I was going to say clogging storm surface. No, no, we're like talking about the benefits. You have seen the you're going to get it. Benefits today. <laughs> then you should have skipped it. <laughs> okay, well, so, so if you guys have listened to the things you've just said, Kenton, what's yours? Uh, that, that comes to mind. Habitat, wildlife habitat. Okay. So mostly what we've just thought about and talked about is the environmental benefits, right? Like, because that's the world that we're all in and that's what we think about. But one of the big things about trees, or one of the many big things about trees, is that trees are also linked to having very strong social well-being and public health benefits. And those are really important things when we think about our communities moving forward in the world. They've been shown to reduce pollution. Yes, that's environmental, but it's also a human health factor. They've been shown to help people increase both their physical and mental health. You have tree-lined areas, particularly in the center. People are going to go out and walk in those shaded areas rather than stay in their homes where it's nice and cold. They do work to strengthen community ties. So you've got that in the form of tree plantings. You've got that in the form of cleanup days. You've got that in the form of gatherings and parks under the shade of trees that will bring families and friends and neighbors together. You've also got that as a tie to history. And so not only just like your, your family member maybe that you've got planted in a tree near them, but also historical trees that have been there for hundreds of years through lots of the development of our countries. They've been trying to degree circulation. You can read through most of this. Um, but if you all haven't already thought about these or read about these before, there's a lot of research out there that supports this. I went into at the top. I've got some references at the end if you guys are interested. But there's a lot of research out there that shows how trees really impact us on our day to day, not just environmentally. They have lots of economic benefits. Um, they've been shown to increase shopping in, um, in downtown areas. If you have a tree-lined street, there's been studies that have asked neighbors as well as businesses to look at pictures and rate them on a scale of one to three, like what's your likelihood of shopping in this kind of area and how much time will you spend there. And um, they always show up that tree-lined areas are going to have people stay longer, they're going to have happier employees, they're going to have people spending more money. There's even research that suggests that people are willing to spend more money for the same product in a tree-lined area versus an untree-lined area. Part of that may be that the people are in the tree-lined area and they'd rather just go ahead and buy the product while they're there rather than go to the other place. Um, I don't know, I don't look far enough into that. But there's a lot of research out there that supports all of that. And of course the environmental benefits, those are things we all know, things you guys talked about just a minute ago. Um, removing pollutants from both our air and our water, uh, reducing storm water runoff, retaining soil on stream banks is really important, um, cooling our waterways for all the reasons that Kenton was just talking about with the micro and macro invertebrates, um, and a re redu reduction of our heat islands within our cities, which is really important as we grow and we become more populated and we have more impervious surfaces. So the trees are really beneficial for us in more than just the environmental way. Basics on the tree biology. Um, Many of you probably know this. I'm not going to go through this whole diagram. I'm just going to pick out the portions of, the, of a tree that I think are really important that I really want to kind of drive home for people that may not work with trees. 
um, or may do and may not really remember all that biology, because I'm sure it's been a long time ago, but the, the bark of the tree, the part of the tree that we always see and we understand, is variable tree to tree. It, it's based off the species. And so that you can think of a beech tree. They have a really thin bark. And then you can think of a pine or an oak, and they have a rather thick bark. The job of the bark is to protect the insides of that tree. And so the insides of that tree are like the insides of us. You know, it's all of their, all of their inner workings. Everything that keeps them alive is inside of that bark. So I always think of the bark as like our skin. You cut your skin, we heal. They don't really heal, they'll just kind of close over it and try to, and try to amend themselves. Some trees are really good at that, some trees are really horrible at that. And so it really depends on how well you take care of that tree and your landscape as to how much benefit that tree is going to provide you and for how long. Just inside the bark, and again that bark uh, depth can vary, species to species, is the cambium. The cambium is where all the living tissues of the cell are created. All the divisions happen there. They either come outside to the bark or they create the inside pieces of the tree. And so that cambium layer is really never any more than maybe two centimeters thick. It's tiny. So anytime you hurt the outside of that tree, you're basically digging right into that cambium layer, which then affects the ability for that tree to grow healthy and, and keep rot from happening inside. Inside the cambium layer is the phloem. Who thinks they know what the phloem does? Because I would always get them confused. Flow them up. Flow them down. Down. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Flow them comes down. It brings the food that is being created in yeah, the leaves the down to the tree. Flow. That's right. So flow, flow them. It comes down. The xylem is what takes the water and the nutrients up out of the out of the soil. So those are the really important pieces of a tree. You know, you also have your heartwood, which is carbohydrate storage and and structure for the tree, and then your um, your sapwood, which is like the the wood that's not quite the new growing material anymore, but it's also not the storage pieces of the tree anymore. It's kind of this in-between. And then the other really important piece to talk about is roots. And so I think we all know about roots. We talk about roots all the time. Roots of a tree, given the right situations and plenty of space to grow, will grow up to two times the spread of the canopy of a tree. The roots have multiple functions. One of the biggest ones, the biggest, one of the biggest ones for the big roots that we're all familiar with, is to anchor that tree in the ground and to provide support because it has to basically match what's above the tree to balance all of that weight that's up there. And trees, while they're solid, they, they bend. They bend toward the sun, they bend in the wind, and they, they have to, otherwise they would simply just break. So the roots have to be anchored into the soil well enough to keep that tree from falling over or from snapping. The other roots that I'm going to talk about is what we consider feeder roots. And the feeder roots tend to be in that top 6 to 12 inches of soil. It's also throughout the soil. The feeder roots are what bring the water and the minerals up into the tree. They're also where the mycorrhizae attach to the tree, which helps expand that um, the ability of the tree to, to access water and, and other minerals that are maybe further out to the tree. They work in symbiosis. And so when we work in areas with trees, we have to make sure that we're leaving them enough soil volume to do the anchoring as well as to bring up all the water and all the minerals that they need to support the, the growth of themselves. Because just like us, they cannot survive without water. They are living entities. I know it's really hard to see that sometimes because they're just sitting there in the landscape. But every piece of them is alive and, and it functions very similar to how we function. Um, so. That's why we always talk about making sure to not cut with inside of the drip line of a tree. Sometimes it has to happen. We have to make, um, we have to be flexible in urban areas because sometimes it's worth it to try to keep the tree and maybe cut in a little bit further because it's better to try and then have to maybe mitigate it later. Um, but just making sure that we don't disturb the surface there um, so that all those feeder roots can do the job of bringing the water up into the tree. Okay, that was biology. Real quick about how water moves through the trees, and you probably all know that. One of the big reasons that trees are important in rainfall and stormwater reduction is because as that rain hits the top of those trees, first it hits the leaves when it's in full leaf. Then it has to move through that leaf surface, down the petioles, down the stem, and then or the branches, and then down the stem. And so that slows that flow of water from impacting the ground heavy. And so what that does is that lets that water infiltrate through the ground rather than just run off as soon as it hits. Um, the bigger a canopy a tree has, the more the ability it has to slow down that water. It's also the first line of defense of removing the pollutants from the rain and from the water from hitting our soils and getting into our water. Um, because as it slows down, the, the tree absorbs those and it, and it removes that from actually entering into our systems. Um, you know, it hits, comes through our tree and then it hits any understory plants which may be there as well. 
then ideally, in a, in a great situation, it hits that duff layer where the leaves have been able to sit there and decompose and mulch, and then it eventually gets into our soil and can infiltrate into our waterways in a much more controlled manner. Um, just a little bit more about that, you know, it's, it, all of that is dependent on a lot of different factors, one of them being the tree species itself, the spread of that canopy, the size of those leaves, the stem surface area, um, so you know, you've got twigs that are going to slow it down a little bit, but you've got bigger branches that will slow it down a little bit more. If you have tons of twigs, that'll, that'll also help to slow that down. Um, there's, a, there's some information out there called what's um, the surface saturation storage capacity, which is a big player in um, how quickly rain gets to the ground, gets through that canopy and down the stem. I always kind of related to like the surface area of a road or when you're washing your hair. It takes a minute for your hair to actually get wet all the way through. So you've got that initial hit to the tree and so it takes a minute for that, that the branches to start to be able to kind of absorb that and slow down. And then once you get that capacity rate, it slows it down more. Um, differences of course when leaf on versus leaf off, so summer or winter, um, you've got your transpiration rates which also vary by tree. Rainfall intensity is a big one. Um, it, it's shown what some of the research is suggesting, or probably a lot of it is suggesting, that tree canopy does a better job of reducing the amount of pollutants that hit our waterway versus the amount of water that hits our waterway. And, and so um, with that, one of the big, I guess, takeaways from that is that when you have a lighter rainfall event, maybe longer but lighter, you're going to impact um, the reduction greater than if you have one of those really heavy rainfalls. It hits really fast and you don't get a chance to get to that saturation storage point and it just hits the ground pretty quickly. I mean, it still runs right through the tree. Um, and then, of course, intensity, duration, and time of year are all variables in, in how well your trees are functioning um, in reducing all the stormwater effects. Just as an example um, of how much a tree can take up in water, I wanted to, I don't know if anyone's ever worked with the iTree suite of tools. Um, it's really neat. You can put in your home address and put in your trees and find out how much your trees are giving back to you in all kinds of ecosystem services. But I just did one of my trees in my backyard. I've got this beautiful overcup oak in my backyard. And um, it's pretty large right now. And annually at this point, it absorbs about 6,400 gallons of um, water every year. It's a lot of water that's coming out of our system before it even gets into our waterways. That's just one of my trees. Um, okay, and so I just, you know, briefly was going to go through our Lexington Urban Tree Canopy. So we've done two tree canopy analyses. Um, the first one was initiated in 2012. We just initiated another one this past spring. Um, the goals of that was really so that Lexington had an idea of what the coverage of our trees in our community um, accounted for, what those ecosystem services were, where they are, where they need to be planted, and to help try to prioritize how we decide where to plant these trees. Um, it was a way to connect all these people, all of us that are working throughout the community in trees or in water or in environmental services in, in actionable ways to put um, ecosystem services to work for us. Um, in 2012, the Dave Resource Group was hired to do our analyses. Um, that was a long time ago now. That was 10 years. Technology has advanced quite a long way since then. Um, so it took them a little bit of time. Uh, we, I think we got our first report in 2013, and then they updated again in 2015 with some updated um, imagery. And so um, we got that results in 2015. At the time, they said that we had um, about 25% tree canopy cover. Um, that data report card from that year, we asked them to give us some report cards, you know, both, both for the city as well as for each individual council district because we thought it would be really interesting to see how the council members would take that information and how they might be able to use it within their districts. At the time, Lexington was given a C- minus um, as our overall grade. Um, it's kind of probably pretty hard to see these done there, but um, these, these are, I can't read it either. I can't read it right now either, but it tells you like what our overall canopy is, um, you know, citywide, and then but then it has ecosystem services in there, um, the amount of stormwater we're taking up, how it's equitably distributed, and so that's what the different grades are. And I, I have all of this. If anyone is interested or hasn't already seen it, I can share it. Um, this past spring, we redid it. We we went with a different um, group this year. This year we we. Uh, um, 
employed Planet Geo. Um, they've been around not as long as Davy, but they are really very technologically probably um, more in tune with the with the the data that we're asking for and extracting that and using that in, in a sense for us. Um, again, the, the imagery that they are able to use is updated versus the 2012 data. And so our results are a little bit weird to talk about sometimes. Um, and we really, like we just got this the other day, so I haven't went through it um, thoroughly. But they have, they have now said that our canopy is 23%, but we've had a 5% increase. And so how they related that was that the imagery that the previous group had access to um, wasn't as robust and wasn't able to really um, leave out some areas that were honestly not plantable. Um, and for example, Red Mile Racetrack was in the old data as a plantable space, and we all know we can't plant a Red Mile Racetrack because it's a racetrack and you use it for everything else. So things like that were picked up before that we were able to make sure were left out this time. And so while the, the actual number is lower, we've actually had an increase. Um, I think there's a lot of different reasons for that. Some of that is development. We are changing from a lot of open field to um, communities, and it, part of that community development includes the planting of trees. And so where there was once open grassland, there are now trees. Another piece of that is that um, trees that were too small to be captured in the earlier data are now have 10 years of growth on them, and so they are captured in today's data. And I believe Planet Geo was able to incorporate trees of a smaller canopy size into this data than they had been initially able to do so in the 2012 data just because of the technology abilities. I will say that every district grew in canopy coverage aside from District 1. Um, again, we haven't really had a lot of time to start going through and really trying to figure it out. But one of, the, one of the things that we'll be able to use this data to help us do is figure out where we need to put trees. And that's where we come to our storm basin. Um, because storm basins are all over Lexington. And Lindsay helped me out and gave me this great map. There are apparently 1,233 storm basins throughout Lexington. Um, just a little back, backdrop real quick. Um, part of our stabilization budget funds last year provided up 1.5 million toward the creation of um, increasing our tree canopy throughout Lexington. And part of that created a group called the Ad Tree Ad Hoc Committee. Um, it's spearheaded by um, our division of environmental services and council member Hannah agree and, um, and a lot of community members. And so um, in that, as part of our discussions, we started looking at storm basins that could be retrofitted to be plantable for trees. And so um, Jennifer was able to, to pull that data, I'm sure, with the help of the uh, right here, Abby. And thank you. And so of those 1,200 storm basins, about 97 of them are actually retrofitable to have tree plantings put into them. What that basically comes out to is 122 acres of basins that are plantable. Um, but why with trees? Um, well, because based off two of our, of our, um, our urban tree canopy data, one of the things we asked for Planet Geo to give us is how trees are distributed equitably throughout Lexington. Um, and since our storm basins are all over Lexington, um, this seems like a pretty equitable way to think about where to put trees. Um, because many of the t areas where our storm basins are exist in parts of town that, like I said, don't have that. And because many of them are located in areas that have high areas of impervious surfaces. And so just to, to look at our map of, of plantable, or not plantable, of, of the storm basins, in connection with one of the maps that Planet Geo gave us, you know, in Council District, where you can see, so the darker green of, of the map over here are where we have our highest tree canopies. The lower green shows that as they get lower. Um, and so maybe I'm, I'm not, I haven't done the numbers, but from just initially looking at it, it looks like we have a pretty high concentration of storm basins and areas of town that have lower tree canopy coverage. Um, we also show that, you know, this is our, our different watersheds. It also seems that um, down here, I mean, there's a number, of, there's a high concentration, which maybe is part of that town ranch watershed, but um, it seems like the majority of our, our, our basins are spread out through these other community, the other um, districts or watersheds throughout Lexington that, that are lower in our tree canopy coverage. And again, this is kind of probably hard to see too. Um, but it does show where impervious surfaces are. This map shows tree coverage over um, 
impervious surfaces over pervious surfaces, where there is water, where there is no coverage. And um, Council District 1 is up here, and it's, it's rather gray, if you can see in the image. And, and it correlates up here with a lot of area that could be used to provide tree canopy coverage to some of these areas of Lexington that are not currently covered. Um, some of the challenges with that is that not all of the basins, obviously, are owned by us. A lot of them are private property. And so being able to connect with people that have those basins and encouraging them to do plantings and connecting with stewards throughout the community to help with those plantings um, would be a really great way to encourage that tree planting to happen. Um, public property, we have trees that are a nursery that we can supply the trees for. And then for private properties, potentially through our tree ad hoc committee, and this is all of our conversations, is figuring out ways that we can we can fund nonprofits and other groups to apply for um, incentive grants to plant within those water quality areas. Um, just to kind of go back toward uh, reforested bluegrass and what Kenton had met mentioned, um, reforested bluegrass started as a way to really help to fix our waterways. It was a way to help reduce stormwater runoff as well as to reduce the pollutants. Um, 1999 was the first tree planting and um, I think in that early years, about 10,000 tree seedlings were planted each year, all volunteer help. Um, the first couple years, I think they lasted, you know, over the course of a month, over a couple weekends, whenever, like, the, the handful of volunteers got out there. We've grown from that now where we have, you know, over, over five to 7,000 tree seedlings that we try to plant each year. But we always have a volunteer base of about three to 600 people, at least, depending on what pond weather. Um, and so that's a really good example of the ways that we can use these open lands to put trees into the ground and to encourage the public to learn about water and learn about trees and, and to help our water um, quality and quantity throughout Lexington and to help with flooding and to help with all of those other environmental problems and pollutants from getting into our streams. I think it's a really great way too, like Kent mentioned, we've started some research in those sites, um, but I think that the water basins would be a really great way to um, broaden that research just because I would imagine that you have data of the infiltration rates and of the water that currently moves through those systems. If you have that data, and we've had it for a number of years now, and we start planting trees in those and installing permanent planting, or planting, sorry, um, monitoring sites to figure out what that infiltration rate is, how those pollutants change, how the rate changes, how the, how the, um, how the obser ob observation rates um, are, are taken up in those in those basins going forward, I think we could do a really great job changing um, both our tree canopy as well as our, our water quality and quantity problems throughout Lexington. That's all I've got. I won't go to questions. <laughs> do you have any questions? <laughs> yes. I live in that Ashton Park area where we've got a lot of trees, mm -hmm. at least for now. But because of the age of the trees, most of them, I'm going to say a lot of them are over, well over 100 years old, it seems like this year, and maybe the year before, that a week doesn't go by that there's not a tree company in there taking these big trees down. Do you have a program of education that these neighborhood associations can use to talk to their homeowners in those areas? To, there, there may be a, a, another way, a better way, maybe trimming them instead of cutting them down. Some of them are disease and need to go down. But I just think we can't lose, although this is a heavily forested area, we're losing that tree camp canopy a little every year. I mean, more than a little. I right. think. How do you, how do you deal with it? So we don't have an established program where we go and actively go out and, and speak. Um, I know that I and others within our group will go out to neighborhood associations or um, homeowner associations when we've been asked to, and we'll talk at gatherings about the importance of retaining those older trees within our system and, and that there are other options for keeping them. Um, it would be wonderful to start that kind of a program, but um, right now, the way we deal with it is just by word of mouth and by um, being told that this is happening and counting on those of us that are out in the community that do know that there are other options to be able to talk to their neighbors. Um, I think one of the challenges with that, well, there's many challenges with talking to other people about trees because for, I'm sure you all have figured out, trees are very controversial, unfortunately, because all they want to do is grow. Um, 
<laughs> All they want to do is, is, is live, and so um, they didn't mean to do that, but um, some people really love trees, and some people really hate trees, and some people just don't understand why they hate trees. Um, they, I think they just don't understand that just because a tree is big, it's not hazardous. Just because a tree is hollow, it's not hazardous. Just because a tree is dropping acorns, it doesn't mean it's bad. Um, People get really afraid, um, and, and it just all goes back to just not really understanding the biology of a tree, yeah. the strength of a tree, um, the root system of a tree. Um, and I think a lot goes back to, unfortunately, you know, we get, we get um, billed for keeping some of the infrastructure around our houses intact, like sidewalks. Um, it's, it is on us, you know, as the, as the homeowner. And so a lot of times trees will heave sidewalks because, because the soil under those sidewalks is compact. And so the roots can't go down, so they can only go up and the sidewalk's there, and so the sidewalk gets heaped. And so figuring out ways to mitigate that, to, to offer alternatives to fixing those sidewalks, I think is a big, would be a big step forward. Um, a lot of education goes into it. I think, I think one of the big takeaways from trees that people don't get is that um, in the beginning, trees don't give us back as much as trees do as they older, are as they are when they are older. And so for the first 10 or so years of life, trees are more of a sink. And so they really take more out of the um I'm using that word right sink. They take they take more to get growing. So they're not giving back quite as much. Once they hit about 10, 15 years, they start being able to really um, exponentially grow in the resources that, that they both take in as well as give out. And so I think a lot of that is people and developers um, don't understand that just because you are putting in 20 little trees, it's okay to take out. It's not okay to take out that big tree that was existing there because they don't equal, um, and they won't equal for a really, really, really long time. Um, so a lot of it's just education. Um, I'm always happy to go and talk to neighborhood associations. Um, there's one thing I feel like I know: it's trees, and um, hopefully, I feel like I can talk to people in a way that helps them to understand that. Um, but yeah, so if you know of anyone that that wants to have someone come to talk, or if you have any inlets, I'm, I'm always open. You can always reach out to us at Environmental Services. Well, the insurance companies are getting into this now in that they're requiring some homeowners, <coughs> if they've got trees too close to their house, to, to take them down. So I haven't heard that. I feel like that probably stems from the fires, um, you I know, it stems from fire fear. Um, well, root damage, damage to the house, root storms. Right. Which is, you know, I mean, they don't live in bubbles. They're gonna, we have to be able to, to coexist and, and damages are going to happen. And it's, it's, it's how well um, we, it's our, it's our level of tolerance for what those damages are. Um, and, and insurance is requiring them to take them down? Yes, well, yes. Pay, pay a higher or, or pay a higher encouraging them. Yeah, yeah. Right. Hmm. So they need some education. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, well, I mean, and so that's the trick, right? That's the tricky thing, because trees are everywhere. Everyone feels like they understand trees. Everyone knows they can plant a tree, but not everyone knows a tree. Yeah, hey, Heather, uh, okay, Pinsley, yeah. Water Quality. Um, I guess uh, this idea, I think, is controversial uh, from, a, from a maintenance perspective. Um, you know, we require maintenance. We have. We have maintenance requirements of basin. Really, the design of the basin, uh, you know, it requires water to flow in and out of this thing. Um, trees, I see lots of leaves already in basins and limbs in basins, and it, 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 that's a maintenance issue. So I'm just thinking that it's yeah. maybe counterintuitive for us to provide, you know, more of a maintenance issue to our basins. And would that has that been considered? Has that been discussed? That, is there any data out there that uh, you guys would consider? It's definitely considered, it's definitely cons discussed. Um, maintenance is probably, in our division, one of the hardest things to figure out. You know, like your question earlier about why can't you just go take over those lots? Because we don't have a way to maintain them. Um, that's why it's not a good idea to, to take over new lots before we can figure out what to do with the existing lots. And so with the basins, um, there, I'm sure there's data out there. I haven't looked into it yet. Um, we're in the beginning stages of talking about what this might look like. And, and I'm sure part of that discussion would be figuring out what 
would make maintenance the easiest for that and um, how that might need to be adjusted. You know, how, how those designs are probably, you know, in the long term, in the big picture, going to have to be adjusted. Because if there's one thing that's been shown that will help us with our climatic changes, it's trees. Trees are a vital source to our whole water transpiration and ecology environment. Um, they, they, they like the oceans. Like if you think, I'm sorry, Ken, I know you have a question. If you think about, and just me being a tree nerd, this is very basic and it might not be founded at all, but I think that like our world is basically developed to have water, trees, and mountains or rocks and snow. Because if you think about it, if you were to just leave a field go, yes, you'd have your grasses come in, then you'd have your weeds come in. And if we didn't have invasive plants, then you would start having your woody plants come in. And so the ultimate, the ultimate, um, the ultimate age is not the word I'm looking for, but the ultimate um, form of our environment is woody. It's trees. Like that is that is basically the end of of that cycle of, of restoration and regeneration. And so um, we have to design with trees in mind. We have to bring them back into our world to to encourage those systems to repair themselves and to to better our water cycle. Yes, Ken. I, I, I think you might have some examples that you can look at. For example, the Wellington Park uh, basin that's been forested for, that was, a, I think that was a reforested site. Well, that was an old field and that became a reforest site and then became the park. And then became a retention basin. I'm speaking of the retention basin that's yeah. been oh, forested yes. there. Oh, yes, the other part, yeah. Uh, we have a, a, another retention basin. I know that was forested around 2004, which is in the Horseman Lane area where they put pine trees in it. So, and, and then we planted some trees in the, um, the, the Good Foods Co-op, mm -hmm. or the base behind the Good Foods Co-op in, in one area. So I would think we could look at some of the maintenance issues on that. The other question that I have, and this is unique that engineers would have to answer, is how does this affect the discharge rates, flow rates, and the time to concentration impacts, you know, in, in terms of how these basins are seeded in the larger watershed. I think you guys, do great. I'm, I'm looking at Charlie. Uh, <laughs> but, but, but you guys do analysis in terms of the discharge from a particular basin and have it adjusted so that it doesn't create some, you know, downstream impact. And, I, and, and in, in terms of studying these things, you have how many? How many have you done under this new program? How many have you replanted basins? Yes. We haven't started replanting basins yet. That okay, is, you that's, haven't started. Right. But, but Wellington Way, uh, Horseman right. Lane. Yeah. You know, so, so right. we have some examples, but I, I think we could look at maintenance of those sites and see what kind of cost impact. Uh, yeah. I'm of the opinion it's a win-win because you don't have to pay a contractor to go in there and mow every two weeks. You just have to pay a contractor to go in there uh, every once a season and remove limbs and leaves and that kind of stuff there. And I think the other piece of that too, oh Charlie, go ahead. Also said, just to, to make to both of your points, because they're both valid in yes. my mind, uh, it's stuff that gets into the basin, whether it's leaves, grit, grocery carts, <laughs> all the stuff that ends up from from urban presence. Um, building these things or modifying them in such a way is that you're intentional about how you're going to get in and how you're going to get out. Because the ones you mentioned, yeah, those were easy ones to root for us. They were low print hanging fruit. Gabe and I think about ones like Berkwood that you can't even get in there at all to get a oh, cement block out of there. Sure. And so, and so that's why some were probably not eligible for for replanting. Um, but I think too, along those lines, Ken, that I, I meant to mention too, when we think about designing basins, um, excuse me for my my ignorance on this, but but the but the way that I have experienced the design of basins is that. Um, the amount of water infiltration that's needed and necessary for the outflow and for retention is calculated. And then it's calculated the amount of soil that has to be removed and the trees that have to be removed and everything else that has to be removed to get this space. In that, however, and this is where I could be completely wrong, I feel like what's missing is that calculation of the water that's already being taken out of those systems by the trees that currently exist in those systems. And I'll use Southland Park as an example because there were very large bald cypress in the middle of, of well, it's been altered now, but there were some very large bald cypress and other water-loving trees within the, what has now been created as the basin of that park, which is needed for, for that area that airs floods heavily. But I just wonder, and I know the calculations are out there. I think one of the challenges is that these are living beings, and, and so calculations are a little bit different than being able to work with something that is man-made and structured. 
but are the calculations made and incorporated into the bigger picture calculations of how much water is already moving through that system and with the trees that exist there? I'm going to look over the grade, but I think the answer is no. Yeah. And so that's there. Yeah. The data is there. There's a it's ton a of volume, research. It's a volume thing, really, in and out. In, right. In, in, infiltration is, you know, you know, incidental. But it's mostly just, okay, keeping volumes and flow rates pre and post construction the same. Based sure, on, but based so, on peak flow. Right. You know, and so peak flow then changes things because it, it impacts the uptake uh, ability of those trees. Right. But so are those calculations added into that trying to keep it at the same rate as the afterward? What that what those trees are taking out? Because you're not you're not separating that amount out in the initial calculations. In infiltration. Well, absorption. Tree, trees, yeah. tree impacts. Vegetation impacts. I, I would argue they were considered, okay, okay but, but since they're calculating for the 1% chance storm, i.e. the 100 year storm, uh, the, the volumes at that level are just so that, that, that we lost the tree contributions uh, down in a small part of that. Okay. Where, where the stormwater basin design calculations generally, I think you do what, 25 year uh, and 100 year, or what? what, what, what there's, there's, there's a whole whole list of them in the And, and so, so what, they, what they are not looking at are how the other storm events that aren't big enough to qualify for those flood control goals um, are impacted by, by your impact. So I think there's a whole class of storm events that, that are just not included in that analysis. Well, would benefit from that. You know, that, that's the quantity part. You know, you've mm -hmm. also got the water quality volume and runoff reduction part mm -hmm. in new development where those kind of things are looked at. Okay. Where's the water being discharged? Um, you know, are you changing it from a forest to a grass? So you've got the... That's captured. You know, that's that 90th percentile storm that we, that they have to, developers have to account for as far as runoff reduction and water quality volume. So, I don't know, did that answer that part of the question? I think it kind of did. That yes, now it's looked at. I mean, you know, more than 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago, it wasn't. The fact is, development isn't removing a whole lot of trees, protecting our trees, trees are out of the way of development. Some of the areas that appear to be heavily wooded, it's stuff that's come up in the last 15 years or whatever. It's pear trees and scrub. Actually, we're not moving a whole lot of large trees in development. Some though, but we're protecting them as well. We are doing a better job of protecting them. There I, are oh, there I are numbers. Guarantee you, we are. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's what I said. Yes. Yeah, we are. I you. Yes. Yeah. So I can't speak to engineering the volume and stuff, but as far as the maintenance concerns, um, like that is a valid question. And when we were we had planted in Eureka Springs, some of the things we looked at is what not to plant, um, like willows that are very messy or uh, trees that potentially have acorns that, you know, that flow down or what is it, coffee trees with the pods, that kind of thing. So I think as we go through this and look at this potential, that's something, I'm not a tree person, that's what Heather is, she looks at me for the water side of it, is to look at the uh, species that would be approved for a lower maintenance uh, for those detention areas so you don't have the clogging as much of the clogging concerns. But Gabe, yes, maintenance is always one of the top. You have to you have to go to maintain it, or else it, it's a it's a it's not a wasted effort, but it's it makes the challenges um, really hard later. Yes. One more item on the maintenance piece. I think what we've seen through the years in doing inspections of detention basins is where there are trees. Um, in the basin, the basin seems to be able to handle the leaves that fall and attenuate those. And um, as long as you keep the concrete channel clear of grass clippings and tree leaves, it usually functions pretty well. And the times where we've seen real maintenance issues are when um, property owners have intentionally taken their grass clippings from their front yard and, dump, and dumped them in the backyard in their detention basin, or they raked all the leaves from their front yard and taken them and put them in the detention basin. So it's that, that extra load that, that causes the maintenance issues and not just what's in the basin itself. 
and grit. And like I said, the other thing too, I mean, we, we have some bases that we shovel grit out of on a regular basis, and it just comes off the street. It's kind of a byproduct of street sweeping. Thank you very much. Well, I think that was wonderful, and I think maybe kudos go to um, Lindsay for having all three speakers be totally connected and sort of wrap background to screen spaces and things. So I think that that's really great. So as chair, I do nothing but show up, and Lindsay does all the work. Um, and, and having said that, I'm going to turn it back over to Lindsay, who's going to talk about our watershed of large seats and, and new topics. Thanks, Amy. Um, okay, well, thank you, presenters. That was awesome. Uh, great discussion. Hopefully we can keep those going in the coming months. I uh, just want to bring up two of our watershed at-large seats have expired. And so I know the last meeting, Eileen and Jim, you both uh, mentioned that you'd be willing to uh, stay on if needed. But I also wanted, before we well, yes, Ken. Here. Well, I was going to move that we accept the nominations <laughs> by acclamation. Okay. <laughs> second. 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 I need a second. Yes. A second. Jeff oh. seconded. Jennifer has seconded. So Ken has made a motion, and Jennifer has second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Welcome back, Jim and Eileen. <laughs> <laughs> Three more years. You're stuck with them. This really is this. Um, just a couple things as far as potential topics for our next meetings uh, and a reminder of when that is. I think December 2nd is our last meeting of the year and so the hope is that we can have an update on West Hickman and we don't know. We don't know. <laughs> We're still working on We're still it. Working so, on it. Um, so that's the future if not December in the future is getting an update on the West Hickman watershed management plan. And then in March of next year, we'll have a presentation on UK's PFAS sampling that they've been working on. And so uh, Tiffany Messer has been working on that over at UK, so we're really interested to see. Um, they're still waiting on some more results, and so we're giving them some more time, but that'll be a really interesting presentation as well. I would like to open the floor for other potential topics for our coming meetings. Yeah. Uh, because our illustrious planning department Forcing this infill concept, whatever it may be, on us. The thing I've noticed, we've had a lot of flooding in my neighborhood as a result of these expanded garages and, and uh, impervious spaces. And we've got requirements on what these, this type of infill. They, that they need to meet, but they're obviously something is not working. And I've talked to some of the other, some council, my council person is clueless, but others have had complaints from their uh, constituents about the same thing, that we're not, these expanded garages and areas aren't, aren't uh, controlling their, their runoff. And to me, it would be, it seems like there's a breakdown. Uh, I keep hearing that code enforcement is coming out to look at this. And they're telling people there's nothing we can do. Well, that's not, shouldn't be the case. I don't think we should ever tell our citizens of those. We can certainly look at it. We can certainly, we've got to improve what we've got. But what we've got now, there's, there's a breakdown seems to me somewhere in our approval process to get this this work done and it, it's only going to get worse as the, this infill concept gets expanded and uh, there's other aspects of that that I think they've been ignored too but that's at another time but I, I just think it would be good to drop back we spent time on this, you know, size of lots and what you've got to do, uh, just a couple of years ago, and there are requirements in it. I don't think engineering is. I don't think the information is getting to engineering that they can help make decisions. I'm not blaming engineering. I'm just saying I don't think. I think it's a lack of involvement, or it appears to be that 
these projects move forward without anybody looking at, you know, what's the impact of this, you know, on, on drain, and do we need, and the other thing is do we need to make some modifications to the ideas that we've already got on, on, the, te on the, in the books. But there's a problem, and there's going to be a bigger problem as this becomes more prevalent in our neighborhoods, and especially in our older neighborhoods, because the younger neighborhoods don't have to comply with this because they've got covenants and stuff like that where you can't build this stuff. So we're putting that, these things are going to be forced into these older neighborhoods with 100 year old storm sewers, and you don't have the infrastructure, and you've got to have the control to begin with to keep it from uh, uh, harming the. Uh, uh, the neighbors and, and things like this. I mean, this this is going to be a big problem that we go on. So you're talking like a deeper look into redevelop, like infill yeah, redevelopment, or specific. What, what's in, the process for what though? I'm just getting clarification for like infill yeah. on properties or at homeowner lots or both. Oh, I'd start with homeowner lots. Yeah. So you're talking less than one acre, you'd say. Yeah. Uh, or or th there's a threshold um, of the size of lot yep. where uh, and, and and like some of these smaller quarter acre lots they <coughs> they could repave those and do those one lot at a time and that has a, a an overall impact that we lose because we don't have the same review that we would say for an acre lot or uh, you know when they yeah, develop that. Got so so is it are you talking the small lots, larger lots, or all of the above? I think all of the above. Okay, we need to so see there's, what your, there's your talk. What what are we? What are the requirements, and are they are they working? Is this working? Uh, because uh, apparently, my experience. <coughs> not, I mean, it's not my property, but it's some of my neighbors. Then you've got a daisy chain effect where you've got this person's putting in something, and these next door neighbors putting in something, and it's it's. Uh, I mean, when you've got water running into your basement, that's just not, you know, that's not fun. And uh, I think we've got to look at that. As I said, the, our planning department is going to force this stuff more and more and more into these, these neighborhoods. And, uh, you know, I just want to make sure we are, the public is protected what, what we've got on the books now. And second that topic. Okay. I saw this the I and I pressure coming in. Be interesting to learn more about the program and how it's changed over time. Okay. Um, you know, how big of a problem it was and how big of a problem it is now. Okay. Lindsay, I think it might be whenever it's ready, the Empower Lexington plan. I don't know that it's not for December, but for whenever it's finished, I think not directly water related, but it all relates to water. Okay. Anything else before we move on? All right. Just want to wrap up with a few announcements. Uh, we have our watershed <coughs> focus monitoring program volunteer sample or training coming up next Friday, uh, September 16th. That'll be at the Tom Branch wastewater treatment plant in the training room. It starts at 9. Uh, we've got uh, we're kicking off with wolf run sampling this fall, phase one, and then we will do phase two sampling next summer. So um, as many volunteers, if you have people in your communities or in your neighborhoods or people that you may know that may be interested, let them know about this training and we'll do another one in the spring as well for uh, summer sampling. Um, just a couple other, I don't know if we've got some DES folks that want to speak to some of the things coming up, uh, but Art by Nature, I don't know a ton about these, but it's now through September 24th at the Loudon House, and the Nature Hop is coming up next weekend. True. Sure? Okay. Um, and then just an announcement that Demetria has been nominated to serve as the Secretary Treasurer of uh, is it Siswa? Is that the right way to say it? Southeast Stormwater. Yeah. And the elections are October 6th. So congratulations, Demetria. Hopefully, it's a shoe in. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, Heather, you didn't say anything about Tree Week, but Tree Week's coming up October 6th through the, or October 8th through the 16th. 
Um, I know there's a bunch of events that you all partner with UK and there's lots of stuff that, that happens, so stay tuned and um, you can go to the website and look up, is it like Lexington? You can just Google Tree Week 2022. Yep. It's actually a, a conglomeration of the Urban Forest Initiative, which is basically a conglomeration of, of all of us within the tree world um, that kind of put this together. We reach out to the community to hold events throughout the community. They're all free, except for I think two. One, one is a nonprofit floor clip and nature walks, and then I believe there's a coral, um, fire <coughs> coral piece group that's joining us this year. So those are the only ones you have to pay for. But everything else is free. It's tree related. There's talks, walks, um, education. There's yoga. There's tree plantings. There's um, invasive <coughs> species work removal days. There's um, reforest and bluegrass walks. There's all kinds of all kinds of things. Um, and actually, it started in Lexington, and now it's also in. Hazard and Berea and Danville and um, Paducah. Yeah, I mean, it, uh, we have we have branched out throughout Kentucky um, pretty much right now, which is really exciting for us. Um, so yeah, go to Tree Week 2022. It's all free. It's all through the week, um, varying times throughout the days. Um, if you want to host an event, you can do that too. Awesome. And then on November 25th, the day after Thanksgiving, there's the Gobble Grease Toss. I think that's at a school. Is it right. Red? What is it? It's at Redwood. Redwood School off of Nick Jesslin. Jesslin. Okay. Um, so that's November 25th, and then our next meeting is December 2nd. There's nothing else? Can, yes? Amanda? Yeah, so UK Extension is working with Friends of Wolf Run to offer a Greenways tour on Wednesday, September 28th from 1 to 4 in the afternoon. Um, so we'll send more information or you can stop by and see me and I'll add you to our distribution list. Greenways tour September 28th. 28th. 1 to 4. We're going to start at Valley Park, park at the Noville Drive parking area. As long as we have a, a nod from that side of the room. So, <laughs> <laughs> I can see a slight nod. <laughs> Uh, the Division of Water Quality will be hosting their workshop with the Engineering Development Construction Industry Workshop um, on December 16th. We won't see this group again until December 2nd, so go ahead and get it on your calendars. It's going to be back in person this year at the Fayette County Extension Office. I'm sure Richard will have his donuts there as usual, so you don't want to miss that. We're revamping it. We'll have a lot of good stuff this year, so thanks. Yep. Thanks, Andy. Yep. Uh, so Bluegrass Green Source has a water quality incentive grant to um, give mini grants to homeowners in Lexington for riparian buffers or rain gardens. And so our final education um, piece, which you have to attend in order to get the $500, is on Tuesday and it's virtual. Um, so September 13th, if you want to attend and you live in Lexington, um, you can get a grant to plant things in your yard or water. Any other hands? All right. Say we're good. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Adjourn. I don't know. Do I need a motion for that? All in favor, leave. <laughs> Ken says all in favor, leave. Thank you. <laughs>